Greetings, Quincy Church family. We welcome you to another edition of Online Church. Today we actually have two sermons running, one in Susanville, one for Susanville, and one for you all there at Quincy. We're doing that because the sermon here in Susanville is part of the Marriage Seminar series, which we will be preaching in Quincy as soon as the church reopens. So I invite you now to bow your heads as we speak with the Lord. Lord in heaven, we come before you this Sabbath morning thanking you for another day where we can leave aside the cares of this world and just focus on our time with you, our relationship with you. Lord, it's been difficult because our church is closed presently, but we ask that you may work in the minds of the legislative uh, individuals, the people in the county and in the state and in the region, that they, Lord, may pull back on this purple tear and allow us to reopen. We pray also, Lord, that you may stop the spread of this virus and that the people in this community may be kept strong and may be kept well. We thank you for the 10 days of prayer you have given us this opportunity to connect with you. We thank you for the work you've been doing with Joan. We pray that you may continue to touch her with your healing hand and that she may recover quickly. And we ask that you be with all the members and friends of the Quincy Church. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the late 1800s, a British express train was going down the tracks. It had a number of important dignitaries on board, but of course the most important person was the Queen of England herself, which at the time was Queen Victoria. Now, the engineer was controlling the train. It was the middle of the night, and so the train had a very bright light, a lamp in the front that kind of provided enough light so in case there were any obstacles or in case there was anything in the track, then the conductor could have time to stop the train. Now, as he was going down the tracks, suddenly there appeared before his sight what looked like an ominous being. The being looked as if he were cloaked in some kind of robe and something covering his head, but he was waving. He was waving his arms. And to the engineer, the conductor, it appeared that he was warning them. And so the conductor, taking the warning very seriously, began slowing the train until it came to a complete stop. Now, once it stopped, uh, other workers on the train got out. They went to the front of the train to see what was happening. The engineer got out as well. He was talking among them. There, some of the other dignitaries and representatives of the queen also came out to see what was happening. And uh, there was a group of individuals in the front of the train talking. And he was telling them that he had seen this figure that was cloaked in black but waving his hands about in front of the train. And it appeared to him as if this person was waving him to stop and so he slowed and stopped the train. Now, uh, the folks that were with him, they went looking around to see if they could find this individual that had helped stop the train, and then a few others made their way further up the tracks. Just about 100 feet up the track, just beyond the, uh, the scope or, or the full vision of the lamp, this is when a few of the workers discovered that one of the bridges, a bridge that was over a high ravine, it had somehow washed away or been destroyed. And if the train would have passed over it, they all would have plummeted to their death. Now, this brought chills on, upon everyone. 
and they wondered who was the person who stopped them. They could not find anyone in the region that was out there who would have been dressed in that black cloak that would have been standing directly in front of the train, and yet the train was able to stop without hitting this person. And where was this person? Finally, they decided that it was the figment of the imagination of the engineer that maybe he hadn't seen anything, that maybe he just thought in the shadows and in the darkness that he had seen something. But the engineer was certain that he had seen something, but what he had seen, if it wasn't a person, what was it? They looked about that day, found nothing. But once uh, the bridge was worked on and the train was sent back some distance and redirected on some other tracks and eventually made its way to London, the engineer decided when the train was uh, in storage, he decided that he would go and examine it very closely. And so he went to, to where the lamp was, this bright lamp at the front, and he began looking about he stuck his fingers inside of the area where the lamp was, and he realized that at the very bottom, there was a moth. And so he pulled out the moth, and he held it up, and he thought, I wonder. So he went inside, turned the lamp on, and then held this moth in a position in front of the light, and there, the shadow was cast upon the area in front and he could see the very same image. He had seen the night that the train was stopped. He realized that this figure that he had seen was a moth. It had flown into the area of the lamp, the light shined on it, and to him it appeared as if it was some kind of figure that was out there waving him. He took it seriously and stopped the train. It ended up saving everyone's life, but he concluded that it was just happenstance. He shared it with other folks, and they said, wow, what a coincidence, how lucky we are. But when this came back to the ears of the queen, she said, no, no, that is not happenstance. She was convinced that God was at work. She was convinced that God not only saved her life, but that God, using this moth, had saved the life of everyone aboard that train. Folks, the Bible teaches that God is at work. He has been at work throughout human history. And he has at work seeking to save what was lost, seeking to give the human race an opportunity at life. The cross of Christ, for instance, was no accident. It was part of the plan of God to save a fallen human race. Through sin, we caused a rift between heaven and earth. But the cross of Jesus it was God's way of bridging the gap that we had created. A contemporary Christian group uh, sings a song that is called The Great Divide. Maybe you've heard of this group. It is called Point of Grace. It is a group of ladies that harmonize very well. And the, the lyrics of the song says, there's a bridge to cross the Great Divide. A way was made to reach the other side. The mercy of the Father cost his son his life. His love is deep. His love is wide. There is a cross to bridge the great divide. It is a powerful message. Jesus' cross was intended to bridge the great divide created by our sin. God has been at work throughout human history. I would invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And here we find a very interesting story of a group of followers and how the Lord intervened in order to help them and to help others. 
Luke chapter 24 speaks to us, beginning with verse 13, speaks to us of two disciples of Jesus. Now, these disciples were not part of the 12. Jesus had many other disciples, but he had 12 that walked with him everywhere he went, that were close to him always. But then he had others that would come and go, that would find him here and there, that believed in him, but they didn't follow him like the 12. But these two were not part of the 12, but they were followers of Jesus. And Jesus had just died on the cross. And the, the disciples were having a terrible time dealing with this because they had thought all these years that the Messiah would be a powerful earthly king, but now Jesus is no longer with them. He has died. This is the way they're seeing it. They are so involved in what has happened that they don't even recognize Christ when he comes. So beginning here in verse 13, it says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. They didn't recognize him. They didn't know who he was. And the scriptures are even telling us that their eyes were restrained. Their eyes were restrained. Verse 17 continues, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these, in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to, condemn, to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that if he who was going to redeem Israel indeed, besides all this today, is the third day since these things Happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all scriptures the things concerning himself. Here we have two disciples. They have been saddened by the events. Jesus has died on the cross. But here it is Sunday morning. Jesus has been in the tomb Friday evening. He rested in the tomb all of Sabbath. And he resurrects Sunday morning. These disciples had already learned that the ladies had gone that they had seen an angel, that the angel had told them that Christ had resurrected, but they weren't ready to believe it. Because all their life they had been taught that the Messiah would be some powerful earthly king, that they were not ready to understand. But then Jesus, he intervenes, and he begins to speak to them about the wonders of Scripture. He begins to open up to their minds, everything that the Old Testament said about the Messiah, and their hearts begin to race. Their hearts are moved as he opens up Scripture to them. 
It says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus was clarifying in their minds what his ministry really was about, what his work as the Messiah really was about. But then we notice something very interesting in verse 24, or I'm sorry, verse 28. We just read verse 27, but verse 28 then says this, then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. Now, this is very interesting because they had arrived at where they needed to go, the location they needed to go. But Jesus continued as if he was going to go past the town and continue on the road. Jesus was walking as if he was continuing on the road. Now, if we look at this text in the NIV, it reads like this. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. You see, the Lord had been expounding, he had been opening their minds to the truths of Scripture, but now it came a point where they had to decide. He had intervened in their darkest moment. They were sad. They had heard rumors that Jesus had resurrected. The ladies had reported it, that angels had come to them. Even some of the apostles had gone to the tomb and saw he wasn't there, but it was too impacting, and they weren't ready to receive it yet. And so these two disciples... They don't know what they're doing. They're walking down the road. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to believe. And Jesus intervenes. He opens their mind. He excites their hearts at biblical truth. But then when they arrive at the location where they need to go, the town where, where they're going to stop, Jesus does not continue with them. He starts to walk off. Because now, they have to make a choice. A choice whether they will allow Jesus to continue moving off and miss understanding more of the great truths and maybe even close the door to their eternal destiny and give themselves to doubt and to not believing what they heard. Or they could choose to invite Jesus to abide with them. What we discover is that these men made a choice. They decide to invite Jesus to stay with them. Their hearts were open to hear more of what he was saying. Let's read it in verse 29. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent, and he went in to stay with them. Jesus was about to, to walk on. He was about to continue right past it. He had excited their hearts, but now it was a moment for them to choose. They could have simply let him go. They didn't know he was really Jesus at this point. He was just a man that was traveling with them. So they could have simply said, well, thank you for that interesting conversation and then moved on and perhaps allowed doubt to overtake them and lose their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Or they could have chosen to say, hey, we want more. The choice was theirs. You see, it's a very interesting thing that though God intervenes in human history, and that we find in Scripture itself that throughout human history, God has taken steps to save his people, to help his people. The Lord never forces his way upon his followers. They must always make their choice for the Lord. We are always free to choose whom we will serve. Jesus intervenes, but then the moment comes where he gives the choice to them. They must choose to whether continue to abide with him, to hold him, and to be close to Jesus, or to let him move on. 
This is the fundamental point here. If the two disciples had not pressed the invitation upon Jesus, he would have continued on the journey. The Savior may have walked out of their lives and their loss might have been eternal. As humans, we always have a choice because the Lord will never force his way upon us. You know, we find a very similar situation that is found in Mark chapter 6, verse 48. We read it here in Scripture. You see, the disciples were caught in a storm. And the water was overtaking them. The storm, the wind, and the rain was powerful. It seemed as if they would sink. But then they saw someone walking on the water. Now the Scriptures tell us that he would have simply passed them by. Notice what it says here in Mark 6, 48. About the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Folks, the Lord was intervening, but he wanted to leave the choice up to them. He would not force himself upon them, so he walks upon the water. When they first see him, they think it's some kind of ghost, and they could have let the fear overtaken them and simply let him walk by. But instead, one of them realizes, this is Jesus. This could be him. And so they call out to him. After calling out to him, then Jesus turns. It was their choice. He would not force himself upon them. He was intervening. But they see him. They could have let fear overtake them. They could have said, let's get far away from that thing as possible and let it go by. But some said, maybe it's Jesus. We read in the book Desire of Ages, Jesus advances as if he would pass them, but they recognized him and cried out, entreating his help. Their beloved master turns, his voice silence silences their fear be of good cheer it is i be not afraid without crying out to jesus they may probably could have been lost at sea i want you to notice the words in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, a very common text. Many of you know it by memory. And the verse says, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him. You see, in this text, Jesus is only knocking at the door. He is not opening the door. He is not walking through the door. He is not breaking the door down. Instead, he is simply knocking on it. The individual has to open. After some period of time passes... Just as anyone who knocks at our door, if we don't answer, if we don't open, if we don't respond, the visitor will simply go away. So the Lord knocks. The Lord invites. But it is up to us to open our hearts, our minds. It is up to us to open the doors of our heart to him. He will not force his way. If he is to abide with us, if we are to abide with him, we must make the choice to open the door to him. The men in Emmaus, their hearts were moved. Jesus had intervened, but he would not force his way. When they arrived, he would not force his way into their home. They would have to make the choice to invite him in. The disciples, he is walking in the midst of the storm. They could have given themselves to fear, but some of them recognize him. 
They call him, and then he turns. The choice was theirs, or else he would have walked right by. The Lord knocks at the door. He may call us at the door. Are you home? But he will not force his way. I've given Bible studies in the past. One time I was doing a series of Bible studies in this one area. A friend of mine and I were, had hit this whole zone. And we had come up with various Bible studies. Now some of them were very open to us. But others, when we came knocking at the door, well, they weren't ready for us. And so you could hear them. You could hear them moving inside. But they kept quiet. We would call at them, we would knock on the door, but they wouldn't come out. And after a little while, we would go. We knew they were home, but we would go. We would go. Jesus, in like manner, does not force his way. He'll knock at the door. He'll call us. But we must open our hearts and minds and allow him in. He will never force his way. Now, how long Jesus knocks at the door, well, that's going to be up to him. But the moment will come where he will walk away. You see, God's kingdom is never a kingdom where he forces his way and he just cleans house and does what he wants. He has the power to do it, but he won't do it because he always leaves our choice intact. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of love and freedom. And we must make the choice. We must choose to abide with him or not. But the truth is that if we keep ignoring that knock, the time will come where Jesus will simply walk away and we will no longer hear the knock. To illustrate this, one preacher writes, he says, I grew up in a small northern California town that had just 3,500 residents. The only thing that broke the quietude of the sleepy mountain community was a Southern Pacific Railroad train on its journey through the valley. That's the only thing that was very loud. But he says all that changed one day when a piercing racket startled everyone in town. Immediately, they focused on the noise. It was the sound of bells that were newly installed in a local tower in one of the churches. See, the bells had that tower uh, at one time had bells, but it had been so many years. And when the church finally decided to repair the bells, to renew them, suddenly there was this big racket clanging in the town, and no one was ready for it. No one welcomed it. People complained, people talked about it, but the church had already spoken with the town, uh, the leadership, and they had agreed that it would be right to reinstall the bells, but for a lot of people, it was just a racket. Still, this preacher says that some months passed, and one day he was out and he started wondering, hey, what happened to those terrible bells? What happened to those bells that everyone was complaining about? And then he realized that the bells were still there. That they were still clanging every half hour. That they were still making even more noise on every hour. But now, he had grown so accustomed to them that he wasn't even noticing them. He didn't even realize that they were ringing. His brain had adjusted to the sounds, and he didn't even realize that they were making noise. You see, folks, we can reach a point where the Lord knocks on the door of our hearts, and we're not hearing it anymore. Notice what it says here in the book, The Desire of Ages, page 490. With every knock unheeded, the disposition to open becomes weaker. 
the impression of the Holy Spirit, if degraded today, will not be as strong tomorrow. The heart becomes less impressionable. There comes a time where we will not hear. Life at preacher didn't even notice the bells anymore. We will not even notice the Lord knocking on our hearts. We will not even notice the calling of the Spirit. And his callings will stop. I think I shared the story of Ragasa with the church in the past. But it's one of those stories that's worth retelling. You see, Ragasa grew up in a certain area in Madagascar. She was a witch. Her grandmother had been a witch. Her mother had been a witch. Her aunts had been witches. And the town knew the family, the ladies of that family, to be people with mystic powers and abilities. But in reality, these witches were connecting with demons. They were connecting with Satan and his minions. In fact, when Ragasa was still young, spirits would visit her. And they would tell her that she had a special calling. They would tell her that she had a special ability. And they promised her great power and that they would be with her. In order to prove it to her and to the townspeople, they did miraculous things. For instance, they told her to walk into the lake near the village and that they would sustain her. And they did. They sustained her underwater for three days. The village people couldn't understand what had happened, only that she had great power. She walked into the lake before many of them, and she remained under the water for days, for three days. And then she just came out. How the demon demons did it? Well, Ragasa never shared, but they did it. She had great powers in the eyes of the village people. They feared her. They feared the spirits that gave her this power. In fact, there was another instance when rebel troops, anti-government troops, had come into the town. They had claimed the town as theirs, but Ragasa, using her powers, chased them out. The people understood that you don't mess with Ragasa. But as it turns out, missionaries came to that region. The story is told through Adventist World Radio. Jim Ayer includes it in a book that is called Transformation. And he talks about these missionaries that had come into the area, Seventh-day Adventist missionaries, and they had been spreading the word all over. But most of the missionaries knew. They had learned the story of Ragasa and the demons that she worshipped, and so they simply stayed away from her. But there were two young ladies that believed that God was powerful enough to save even Ragasa. And so, without fear, they came to Ragasa's house one day. And they sh began sharing with her. Now, at first, they just didn't blurt it out, but instead, they befriended her, and she saw their kindness, and so she opened the doors to them. And these young ladies began sharing truths with her, began sharing the truths of the Bible. Now, the demons began appearing to Ragasa and telling telling her to ignore these young ladies, don't give them audience. But the words that the young ladies spoke and the book from which they spoke from, they were things that Ragasa had never heard. And they were things that made her heart move. And so she, she was interested. And she did not send them away. Well, the young ladies continued to visit. And the demons told Ragasa that if they continue to come, they're going to destroy the girls, they're going to hurt them. But Ragasa remembered that the girls had told her that their God was stronger. And the girls kept coming, kept coming, and over time, Ragasa accepted the truth they had presented. And over time, she was baptized and became 
a member of God's family. Now, the demons didn't like it. They threatened her. They tried to hurt her. They attempted to kill her. But Ragasa believed, like the young ladies, that this God that she had been taught about was stronger than the demons. And so she kept her faith. They did many things to her, but the Lord kept her through every one. And then one day, she woke up in the middle of the night. Her house was on fire. And she felt that the Spirit of the Lord was telling her, not only woke her, but was telling her to leave. And so she left the house. She was saved, but all of her things were lost in the fire. Now, after the fire was over, Ragasa made her way into the ruins of the house. A few of her close friends came and were helping her kind of dig through the ashes and the ruins. And Ragasa was looking for only one thing. Only everything that was there for her, it was okay to be lost. In fact, it was better than all of the things, as many of the things that were in the house she had used in her, whole, whole, in her old life. And she didn't want it anymore. But there was something that she really, really wanted. And it was her Bible. And so she told the people that were with her, none of them were Christians. She was the only one at this time. And so she said, I'm looking for a black book. And they helped her. They searched throughout the house. And then one individual found this black book under all this charred material and it moved it moved it away and pulled out this black book but when he lifted the black book everything around it was burned and he lifted it up and he said what is going on here the bible was perfect perfect without any charred edges or pages the bible was was just as it was before the fire and he looked at him and he said, and he said, Ragasa, look, is this the black book you're looking for? And she came and she said, yes, that's it. And she took her Bible. It was pristine and not a mark on it, not an ash on it. No indication that it had been through a fire. And the people that looked at it, they said, wow. And she shared with them and said, this is the book that talks about the God I believe in. The God of great power, stronger than the spirits that I used to worship. And the people looked at that Bible and they said, wow, the book of that God is stronger than the evil spirits. It's stronger even than fire. And so because of the book, because of this Bible that was uncharred and unmarked, many people, believed in the God of Ragasa. She ended up converting many people to the Lord, and she herself became a faithful follower of the Lord, a leader, a beacon for those around her. You see, Ragasa could have chosen to listen to the spirits that had come. She could have chosen to simply ignore the girls and send them away and to follow these spirits that had given her so much power. But instead, she decided to listen to the word of God and to accept what she had heard. Her heart was touched. Her heart was changed. In John chapter 15, verse 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. The word abide there that is translated in uh, John chapter 15, it means to remain, to continue, to stay. In the Andrew Study Bible, it tells us in regards to this verse, no one can snatch us out of Jesus' hand, but we are free to leave if we wish. The Lord never forces us to remain. The Lord never forces us to continue. The Lord never forces us to stay. It is always our choice. We must choose to abide with him or not. In the Adventist Bible commentary, it says, to abide in Christ means that the person must be in daily, constant communion with Jesus Christ. 
It is not possible for one branch to depend upon another for its vitality. Each must maintain its own personal relationship to the vine. As people abide in Christ, Christ dwells in them, and they become like Christ in nature. Folks, we must make the choice. We must choose to abide with Christ. He will never force his way. He always leaves the choice. But when we make the choice, our lives can be impacted like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. When we make the choice, we can be changed like Regassa was changed. When we make the choice, the Lord can use his power to save us as he saved the apostles on the sea. But in each situation, the individual had to make their choice. The disciples on the road to Emmaus had to choose to abide with Christ. Come with us. No, don't go on. Come with us. They made the choice. The disciples, as they saw Jesus walking, they could have let fear take them. But they made the choice to call him in. Regassa made the choice to open her door to those young ladies, to listen to their message, and to allow God into her heart. In like manner, we must make the choice. No matter what has happened in the past, God can make a big difference, but he always leaves the choice to us. God intervenes in history, bridging the gap between heaven and earth, but he will never force his way. The choice is always ours. We must choose to abide. And so, folks, I ask you, are you making your choice to open your heart to the Lord? As we're being told here, the person must make this choice daily. It is a constant communion. We cannot separate ourselves. We cannot cease to abide and continue to grow in Christ, continue to be changed. We must make our choice to continue to abide, not only to let him in once, but continue to abide in him. The Lord never forces his way. He knocks at the door over time, those knocks may stop. The choice is always left to you. I invite you to choose Jesus. I invite you to make your choice to abide with him daily. Let us pray. Lord in heaven, we come before you asking that you may give us strength, wisdom, clarity of mind so that we may know our responsibility to abide with you. For you call us that you will not force us, that we may open our hearts to you, that we may allow you daily to enter in us and change us, filling us with hope and joy and peace. We pray that you may reign in us. We ask for your power in the lives of the Quincy Church family. We pray this in the name of Jesus.